Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar on a just transition towards circular cities, why people matter. My name is Fedra, and I will be uh, the moderator for today's session. We have about 55 minutes uh, for the session today, and so I'm very happy to be joined today by a number of people on our panel, but also by my colleague Marina Henrison from KTH, who will be presenting on the social impacts of circular cities. In our panel, uh, we have Liv Ober from Umeå City, Jan Mertens from the city of Leuven, Ander Ezagiri from OECD, and Amawal from Vinova. Overall, in our 55 minutes, we will be giving you a little background on the Urban Circularity Assessment Framework Project, and we will explain the research that we did on social impact in circular cities. After about 10 minutes, we will then go into a panel discussion with our four members of panel, panel Liv, Jan, Ander and Anna. But there's also an opportunity for our members of the audience to provide questions. As you will find out, your video has been uh, shut off and your microphone as well, but there's a chat and so if you have any questions for our panelists or for Marina or myself, do feel free to put them in the chat. We are keeping an eye out and if we have time left, we will definitely ask our panel members to answer the questions. Alternatively, we will provide you after the session with an email where we provide answers to your questions. We foresee to end around 1.55, so a short seminar today. Um, first of all, so about the project. So we were awarded funding by Vinova in late 2019 for a three-year project. Vinova is a Swedish innovation agency. And under the project, uh, we aim to support cities in becoming more circular by developing an open source assessment framework. With this framework, cities would be able to measure the level of circular economy in the city and assess the potential for improving circularity. It would allow them to identify specific opportunities for resource and energy recovery, but also aside from the very technical calculations of uh, material and resource and energy recovery, we also were going to map the impact of a circular economy transition on society aimed at uncovering any adverse effects. Uh, in the partnership, we are six uh, organizations. I am from SCI, Stockholm Environment Institute, Marina is from KTH, and then we also had four other partners, uh, LIV, representing Umeå Commune, uh, Stockholm Wattenog Afval, the Stockholm Water and Waste Company, Raven Cells, our private sector partner, and WSP. This figure presents our framework, so and the cycle that we follow in the project. So the plan was to develop or adjust a framework, then we apply it to a city, we assess the impacts, and in collaboration with our partners, we uncover where there's opportunities for improving circularity. And our framework is co-created uh, by different types of stakeholders. So Marina and me, we represent researchers, but we have private sector and local governments. Um, we are about a year and 10 months in the project, and so far we have done uh, a lot of background work and are starting with field work as well. But we have so far reviewed frameworks and indicators for circular cities. There's a link provided to a paper. And we also reviewed how social impacts have been considered in literature on circular cities. And also a link there. I now hand over to Marina, who will briefly present the findings of that second paper on social impacts. Thank you, Fedra. Um, yes, as Fedra indicated, there is a, a paper where we investigated the, the how the societal consequences and so, uh, the impact, social impact, is addressed in literature, and also what does it mean for practice um, as well. So, uh, as uh, as we know, uh, cities are already um, implementing and embarking on circular economy uh, pathways, transitioning towards more circular cities. And uh, it is crucial, as in any transitions, for um, 
including circular economy transitions, to include the, um, the social impact. What we found in the literature, um, our results show that the the current uh, resource um, academic discourse as well on, uh, on circular city is quite limited. And uh, uh, out of uh, uh, the uh, potential social impact uh, that could have been addressed, only the social impact uh, areas such as uh, people's way of life, which is largely the employment opportunities, the community cohesion and political systems have been uh, discussed in, in literature. and. Uh, uh, quite largely is also limited to the informal uh, waste uh, uh, management sector. So it, in this case, we clearly observe a, a gap in the research uh, where research is needed to uh, to understand how circular uh, economy transitions impact society more holistically and more broadly. And I will, uh, uh, in its turn, allow the practitioners, will guide the cities and uh, municipalities to, to implement uh, circular economy uh, initiatives or circular, uh, take circular economy measures that do take into account uh, the people, that do take into account the broader societal impact, aside from uh, understanding the uh, transition from the industrial point of view or the closing the biophysical loops. And, uh, yeah, I'd like to hand over to the next speaker and, and Fedra, I guess. Great. Thank you, Marina. So um, we in the academic research that uh, Marina just presented, we found that social impacts are rarely considered and they only look at employment and for in developing countries, that is going from an informal sector to a formal sector, mostly for waste. And then we found that there's also a lot of discussion around governance, and that is mostly in the developing world. To our members or the people, the participants in our uh, webinar today, we prepared a little menti question for all of you, um, asking you, how do you think people will be affected when cities become circular? What social consequences could emerge? We've prepare this on Menti. If you have a smartphone, you can scan the QR code and that should open automatically the question. Um, if not, please go to the website menti.com and use the code 73654078 and you will get the question. And you can type as many characters, I think, as you want. Um, and so in Europe, the question is, in your opinion, what is who will be affected and how will they be affected when cities become circular? Maybe Veni, our colleague, can put this information also in the chat. And so if that's OK, I will now like to go over to some questions which we prepared already for our panel um, for today's presentation. I will stop presenting and I would like to invite the four members of the panel to join me on the stage. Great. Uh, here we go. We have, as I said, Anna Wall from Vinova, uh, social innovation expert. We have Jan Mertens from the city of Leuven, working leading the circular city platform. We have Liv Oberg, a project manager for circular economy uh, in Umeå commune. And then we have Andre Izagire, who works for OECD on the Circular Cities project. Um, Liv, you work with us in the project, but you also work for the municipal government of Umeå. So in your experience with Umeå Commune, do these findings resonate with you? Do you also feel that in the work in, in becoming more circular, that social impacts have been overlooked? Um. I would say no, actually. I mean, I did, I did read the, uh, the the article and I, th I thought it was really interesting. Um, Umia has um, wants to grow, but wants to grow um, with several perspectives. We think of culture um, growth and sustainability and social sustainability. And we also have um, a great focus on gender equality. And for instance, when we build and plan for our neighborhoods. We always plan with mixed types of houses. Uh, and that method, uh, including, you know, uh, rental sector, townhouses, apartment houses, uh, and the fact that we grew, that we grew uh, late uh, has led to the fact that we have no 
vulnerable uh, neighborhoods, according to the Swedish police measure measuring. We also have uh, quite a low uh, child poverty rate, 4.9%, but we have a goal of halving that percentage. So I would say that we, even though we want to become leader in the circular economy to grow, we also have a strong, you know, um, focus on social sustainability and uh, children's rights. Thanks, Liv. Jan, would you say that also resonates with your experience that it could be that it's just in academic literature that social impacts are not considered, but in reality, they are very much at the forefront of what you do? Uh, actually, I think so. I, I have two general remarks on what I read. I, I was not completely happy with, with the article. Uh, first of all, I think um, what is important, we, we should look at social aspects of, for instance, in, in, in employment of our circular economy strategies. What, what is important is that initiatives like uh, repair cafes, etc., uh, which are very useful, that they not remain in, in the margin of our economy. So we, we, we need to have uh, policies to, to have a more structural change. And what we hope to achieve in, in the longer run that with our circular policy, uh, we will have more employment opportunities for vulnerable people who, who might lose their jobs uh, due to digitalization and, and, and robotization. So it is important, and I think um, at least in, in what we are trying to do in Leuven, uh, this is at the forefront of what we are doing. Secondly, uh, what, do, what do we understand with the social aspects? I, I think it's a bit too simple just to look at the distributional effects of circular economy policies and not look at the distributional effects of the absence of a circular policy. What do I mean? When you look at people living in, 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 in poverty or in vulnerable positions, actually they have lots of, uh, let's say, circular competences. They have a very low ecological footprint. I'm not making uh, them an example in, in the sense that we do need to have a good uh, policy to, to diminish inequality and to, to uh, give them uh, more better income. But actually the social problem is uh, that the footprint of, let's say, middle class and higher class is too big. And it is the, the vulnerable people, poor people that suffer the consequences of the too high footprint of other people. So the social dimension is try to lower the footprint of, uh, of uh, the other people and at the same time uh, diminish inequality. And this should be a, a target of a circular policy as well. Thanks a lot for that, Jan. Um, Ander, you uh, co-authored a study that uh, at the OECD with over 50 cities on their circular economy trajectories. Was there any discussion around social impacts uh, across those cities? And like, what were the key uh, findings? Thank you, thank you, Fedra, for, for the question. And thank you to the Stockholm Environmental Institute for, for the invitation. Well, as you mentioned last year at the OECD, we launched a report on the circular economy in cities and regions, where we analyzed the, the results of more than 50 cities and, and regions around the world. Uh, there were cities of different uh, sizes, of different uh, levels of advancement, and we had a, a broad view of the state of the art of the transition at the local and the regional level. We analyzed some obstacles, expectations, and, and we also concluded with a series of recommendations. So regarding the, the, the social uh, considerations, uh, we found that there are three main opportunities or three main benefits that the circular economy can, can bring in terms of, uh, in terms of the so social considerations. The first one is that uh, we saw that almost almost half of the cities uh, of the survey cities uh, had the job creation as a driver for for the for the transition. So in fact, uh, this happens because many uh, many activities linked to to the circular economy, such as the repair, uh, reduce, upgrading, uh, remanufacturing. They are more uh, labor intensive 
than other uh, typical activities more linked to the linear economy, such as uh, the, 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 the current uh, manufacturing uh, industry. So, so we saw, and, and as an example of this, we saw that, uh, for example, it is estimated that in the Ile-de-France, uh, the region where Paris is located, there, there are expected 50,000 jobs uh, linked to, to the circular economy. Also, we found that, for example, in, in London, uh, it is estimated that uh, 40,000 new jobs linked to the circular economy will be created by 2036. And also, we, we saw that another city uh, working on uh, or well advanced in, in terms of the circularity, uh, the city of Rotterdam in the Netherlands, uh, we saw that 10% of, of the current uh, jobs there are, are circular. So job creation would be one of the main motivations and one of the drivers for, for, for this transition. But we also saw that the, the, the transition can also improve the access uh, to services. And when we talk about uh, th this improvement, it, it means that it also uh, it's possible for for people from uh, high income groups, but also from low income groups. So and this can mm -hmm. be done, for example, to, through the, the sharing economy, uh, mm -hmm. which implies uh, different uh, different services like mobility services, bike rent uh, and so on. So we saw that uh, the, the, there is a potential to benefit from low cost and more affordable servi services like uh, leasing, renting, and so on, that can favor this, uh, this vulnerable or low, low, low income people. And mm -hmm. this can be, for example, in terms of uh, transport. And finally, and let's conclude with this, uh, the, we saw that the circular economy can also improve the, the well-being of cities, because if cities are starting to advance towards uh, becoming more uh, resource, resource efficient uh, using uh, more renewable energies, it can have a positive impact on, on the quality of life of, of citizens. So, for example, uh, in Amsterdam, there was a, there was a, a neighborhood uh, which was an industrial area, uh, which, which name is Wilkloterham, sorry for my Dutch, uh, and what they did was to transform this uh, old industrial site to a, to a circular, uh, to a circular uh, neighborhood. And, and for example, in Glasgow, one of the one of the cities we are we are currently working with, uh, it's full of uh, derelict lands as a result of the the, the industrial uh, past, uh, industrial mm -hmm. legacy of the city. And we found that the the city can by, by transforming these areas, it can help uh, improve the the and it can have a positive impact on the quality of life of people in terms of life expectancy and also health so we see that there are many opportunities uh, for the circular economy to improve the social consideration of, of people thanks under and i will actually follow up on your question so you say three benefits job creation access to services and the well-being quality of life of your citizens yeah. now Jan, in your experience the city of leuven it consists of a lot of students, young families, commuters to Brussels, given the, this, the relative short distance. Are those also the benefits that you're seeing that circular economy is creating in your city? Uh, yes, I think so. But what is important to, to, to really grapple what is happening is that you have to start with, let's say, a, a broad focus on, on, on a diverse and very multi-layered circular urban ecosystem because it's at the same time lots of more informal or formal citizens initiatives and at the other end uh, let's say a high-tech research in universities and at all levels uh, people are participating and uh, lots of things are already happening they don't have to be stimulated uh, that's what we see in Leuven there, there's let's say a, a broad uh, yes kind of an ecosystem of, of for instance repair cafes and networks around that there are new initiatives, for instance, uh, some weeks ago, there was a, a specific student repair hub opened to try mm -hmm. to reach students and, and uh, help them with repairing things or lending equipment. Um, so I, I think it is happening, but what is important, and, and this will be, of course, the, the, the target, can we find a way to, to bring these things together and 
and scale them up in a way that that they will lead to to let's say a systemic uh, impact because if all of these things re remain more or less in in the in the margins or do not touch what we call the classical economy then it's not good enough and and we do need ways to to actually in in real terms uh, diminish our material footprint and to go from the one to the next stage next next stage that that's a bit difficult but i see the advantages as as they were scheduled uh, as they were said in our city yes i can confirm that uh, thanks, Jan. And so I like that you said uh, we need to touch upon uh, changing the classical economy and before you mentioned also distributional uh, effects of the circular economy that it will be important to address. Anna, you work for Vinova as a social innovation uh, expert. So how is uh, social innovation being perceived within the circular economy um, and how is your organization working with that? specifically to in transitions? Um, well, I think that at Vinova we worked more and more during the last couple of years with social innovation. And I think in Sweden, as it is a, a welfare state, a lot of what we call social sustainability is controlled by law and policy. And I think that maybe as a factor we've gotten far, but also we've overlooked it as an innovation area. And I think we're catching up now. Uh, and really seeing that we need to look at them together. We have to look at all aspects of sustainability in order to reach uh, our goals. I think uh, because I work with the built environment, we can also see that we have an opportunity now. We're building a lot of new cities or parts of cities, and we have to include that aspect from the beginning. I work with accessibility issues as well, and it's much easier to do it right from the beginning than to change it later on, we usually say. Uh, but I think what you describe also is that um, it is a question of equality, but it's also a question of living in a democracy. And we have to have all citizens on board to be able to do this. Otherwise, we'll just not, you know, we it will be a power shift. So I think it's important to look at it as a as an issue for democracies that we have to be addressed. Um, we work in two ways, both integrated into our calls, which are in other areas, and also specifically addressing social innovation and sustainability in their own calls. So we had one call this year regarding social sustainability in the built environment. So actually, how can you add on that aspect when you are already building or planning? We also have one concerning changed travel habits. Uh, because we see behavior as a big, big uh, issue and, a, and an important part. So how can we give the possibility to make a different choice? And we also have calls aimed specifically at NGOs uh, because we need them to be a larger actor and a bigger player in the, the system change. But we do see, I think, a few challenges that we, we try to address. I think the first one is uh, that projects are often short sighted and I think we're all to blame there on a national level and municipalities and I think it makes it very hard to scale and spread the solution so we don't get the leverage that we want from our projects and we we start over in a new municipality or on a national level. I think also uh, the way the public sector municipalities plan and budget which is also constrained by law uh, means that it's uh, on a yearly basis and I think with social um, sustainability and working with prevention, you need early investments, but the benefits come much later in time or affects another another area. So, for example, you know, making your way through school early on means that you're not. Um, uh, yeah, that, that's a state issue later on, but it's a municipality issue early on. So I think issues like that needs to be addressed and how we can work differently. Um, also, like you, you pointed out, we don't measure it as we do financial issues. We don't have a standardized way of measure, measuring it. We do have several projects now looking at that. And I think we will in the few next couple of years see a lot of standardized way of being able to measure social sustainability. I think also um, conflict of interest is something that's often overlooked. I'm not sure we can meet all different groups interest at the same time. But I think that the fact that we're not addressing it means that we don't even know that we might be affecting some groups in a negative way. Um, and also, how can we find how can we move from projects to long term collaboration? 
vision? How can we work with NGOs, municipalities, so that they together can experiment, uh, meet the users, and so on? Um, yep. Thanks, Anna. So picking up also on what you you said there, and like I think in very importantly for a city like Umeå, you, Umeå has grown to 120,000 inhabitants, doubled its population in the last 50 years. You're one of the largest or the fastest growing regions or cities in Europe. The surrounding neighborhood is quite densely or sparsely populated, I should say. So how is it going for Umeå commune? How do you effectively incorporate, like Anna was saying, it's important for democracy to maintain as you're growing so quickly, how do you ensure that there's good inclusion of different groups in society? Do you work with NGOs in your circular economy plans? And like, how are they incorporated? Well, it's a very good question. And I must say, like with regards to the job creation that we have, as some of you might know, we have huge investments in the northern Sweden. So we have rather lack of people. So if you want to, to work with, you know, um, with in industry work or you know uh, you know a high technology just move to north of Sweden there are lots of jobs but we lack the people up north um, I must say that Umeå uh, it's really important that we don't like as I said we don't have any like vulnerable you know societies we want to keep them safe we also we are ranked the highest region of the social progress index of all regions in the EU we are the region where we have the most trust uh, within, you know, among each other. It's super important to keep that. And I've talked to one of our, you know, uh, uh, important persons who works with the social commission. And an important thing for us is we have our own, you know, statistics department with 10 people employed, meaning that we are we doing a lot of surveys. For instance, we conduct a survey to all 13 to 19 year olds every second year. We have conducted a large survey on social sustainability, uh, targeting you know all the whole city and all neighborhoods. We also have done uh, a local consumption-based study, and we <laughs> do travel surveys. And we do all this because we want to know and we want to understand the living conditions of everybody. Uh, we want to know how people live their lives. Uh, all, is your life, do you have a cultural institution or library close by? Is it a safe neighborhood? Do you talk to your neighbors? Those kind of questions we ask. Uh, we, it's a super important for us to have this kind of knowledge for us when we develop our policies. And there, I would say that circular economy is a, is a mean or method for us to create, you know, and become a climate neutral city for 2030. And it's, it's, we work, I would say, integrated. So even though circular economy is my table, uh it's social sustainability is always you know it's always there you know in the back of my head and i collaborate with my colleagues who works with those issues mm -hmm. so that would be my answer so leave then so given that umio is doing so well on the on the all the social indicators so what are your yeah. so what are your key success factors and what can other cities learn from umio like why is it that you have so little poverty and such good connections with your citizens and what are you um, doing differently than other uh, compared to other municipalities? One thing we do, we spend the most per inhabitant on culture and uh, civil society, the, the commune. That's a, like a big difference from other cities in Sweden. That's one thing. We also actually have two persons uh, employed to work with gender equality. Uh, we have we've had a specific committee for 30 years. That's also the longest in Sweden. So we have we have a tradition of including social sustainability, uh, building and planning from like mixed neighborhoods of types of housing. Uh, so I, it's a combination of things, but I do say, I would say that the statistics department, the gender equality and the high spending on culture is, uh, I do know that the, the reason behind the high score is we have a lot of uh, NGOs and a strong civil society and has had for a long time. Uh, it's been part of our, you know, uh, educational, um system i would say thank you thanks Liv. so if i can then bring it a little bit back to like the distributional effects and like what jan said before on uh, bringing down the footprint so we at the ci we did a study on the uh, umeo's uh, consumption-based emissions back in 2018 where we found that the emissions in umeo are about 10 um, tons per citizen um quite Very high, high. I think, uh, yeah if you look at uh, a study from oxfam and sci also around uh, 
the material footprints and uh, consumption emissions, you find that uh, rich people are the ones with the highest footprints. So how do you bring it to the distributional effects if you become circular? How can you design policy that makes sure that the wealthy reduce their footprints effectively? I don't know whether anyone has any thoughts on that. Maybe under what would work from a policy perspective? How could you effectively tackle this material footprint question? Sure. Uh, thank you, Fedra, for for your question. So, so it's true that it's, it's important to to design uh, when transitioning to a circular economy. It's important to design policies that can ensure that no one uh, is left uh, behind in in this transition. And, and for example, it's true that uh, there is a risk of uh, job loss when, when when this transition takes place, and 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 the differences between these risks can be even bigger when you compare uh, different regions or different cities. So, so so this is an issue to to, to take into account uh, because of course there are when we transition to a circular economy there are winners and and there are there are also losers so so that so that so that's why because the circular economy implies uh, changes in in the in the current uh, in the current uh, economic system so even if it's true that the number of of jobs is expected to to increase in some sectors uh, there are others where uh, things may be a bit more uh, challenging and, and the, the challenge is how to how to make sure that uh, these people are are, are not uh, left behind so cities uh, considering that there might be some benefits and, and some cost uh, here cities can for example it's important for cities to, to focus for example on the capacity building because they have the instruments to identify uh, those economic activities uh, with a potential uh, based on established local uh, resources uh, to uh, they have the potential to to have a, a maybe a, another uh, comparative advantage they cities can also uh, reflect on on strategic uh, skills that can uh, can be useful for for the future transformation and need to think about the the existing or or, or or need to think about the skills that should be improved and, uh, and therefore uh, cities can start uh, designing different uh, training uh, in in green skills that can uh, help uh, in this uh, job creation and also they, they can uh, support they, they can design and and they can analyze the, the existing capacities and skills and review the, the capacities mo, mo, that are uh, mainly associated with uh, with activities such as design uh, setting uh, and implementation uh, and strategy so so th that would be the first one on, on capacity building and the second one and this is linked to what uh, Anna said before or, or, or on the importance of uh, having all the citizens on board in, in this transition, because as we always mention, the, the circular transition is a sure responsibility. It's not something that uh, it's only responsibility of the of the local government. It, it's responsibility of everybody. So uh, it's important to communicate uh, and to tell the people which are the benefits uh, of, of the of the circular uh, transition, the benefits also for them, uh, and to t try to 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 explain them which can be the role uh, in this transition. So here here is it. It's important to engage through this uh, information. It's important to engage with everybody and also with other key actors like uh, universities, uh, private sector, uh, and so on. So. Uh, it, they can collect uh, academic and business pr proposals to to put in place, for example, uh, in place uh, activities uh, that can have uh, a social impact uh, uh, in their implementation. So, uh, to to conclude, just to say, yeah, yeah that this transition must be uh, inclusive, uh, taking into consideration all the all the all the different actors, leaving no one no one behind. 
Thanks for that, Andre. So I think so. One of the things that keeps on coming up for circular uh, circular cities is oh, it will circular economy will create so many jobs. But I have read comments that well, the quality of the jobs that will be created is not that high at times. It's oftentimes lower skilled, very manual labor. Is that something? that you have also found maybe young or leave in your cities. And if you look at the jobs that have been created since you started the circular economy trajectory, are we talking lower scale, uh, skilled jobs or is it all types of jobs? And is it to the potential that we are talking about? I mean, uh, Andre was talking about 50,000 jobs in, in Paris and so on. Do you see the job creation of that size? Well, it may sound a bit negative to, to call them lower skilled jobs. I think it is important that, that we make sure that when we give, for instance, uh, public uh, support to, to the economy, that it does not only go to the high tech, uh, classical technology research things, but that we really create an environment where uh, people that, that may not have been able to, to study long and that they have uh, working with their hands is not necessarily bad on the contrary it might be a very useful job and uh, to to work on on to for instance to repair things and it might be more fulfilling than just only have to collect all the things that people throw away that you can work in a society where things are repaired and and keep their value and you when you are let's say respected for the work you do so i think that that should be the focus that uh, that that they might be very, very useful jobs and, and, and very fulfilling and, and giving people again a purpose of belonging to something and creating value with the skills they had already. Because, uh, for instance, the, the knowledge and the skills people had in, 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 in past times to, to be able to repair things and to keep them there, that they could keep their value. In, in, the, in, in the minds of some people that, that, that seems to be outdated, but it it's the thing we need actually. Lots of things that, that we call modern circular thinking is a kind of, let's say, competence and way of life we have lost along the way. So um, I, I think we should try to uh, see it as a, as a positive sign of an, another kind of prosperity within our planetary limits that, that might be more fulfilling and less um, alienating us from, from what we could mean in our societies. Under you raise your hand. You wanted to come in here, or yes, I uh, very briefly on, on your comment on on the maybe low profile on, on the new jobs. I mean, uh, the the these new jobs and the the circular the 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 positions created uh, linked to the circular economy. It's not, for example, just about uh, linked to the waste collection or separate uh, separate waste. Uh, it can be, for example, also in the in the design of of, of different products or, or or in the design of buildings. So 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 that it takes into account, for example, the the material choice, the the, the, the consumption of, of 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 water and energy, and 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 the, a design uh, that takes into account the future life of of the products and the reparability of of the product. So 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 just to to mention a, an example of of work that, that that needs to that that can be linked to the circular economy and which is not just linked to to for example the, the waste collection so i i don't agree that it's um, it's only uh, low profile uh, jobs thanks Ander. leave yeah, I was going to say uh, about the same thing almost that mm -hmm. I mean, we are just in the beginning of our transition, if anybody could, could call it a transition. But um, where, where I see uh, things are happening is, uh, at, uh, as you mentioned, and you know, at the sort of design phase, when you, when you talk to architecture uh, companies or the building companies or the incubator or the uh, at the business school and their collaboration and in uh, innovation places, that that's where, sorry, the, <laughs> the lights, uh, I didn't move. Um, that's where I see that people are, you know, like new positions are popping up uh, and it's about the, it's in the first phase. Um, and then I also see some some new positions regarding uh, residual residual streams from uh, industries and so on and companies. But 
yeah. But I think if I can add, I think that uh, this would be very local. So I'm not sure what type of jobs we lose in Sweden. I mean, I'm not sure it's high level jobs that would be replaced with, if you want to call it, then low low level jobs. So I think, and I think that's that's the bigger issue if we look at policy or law. Um, I think that's the million dollar question. I think that we see more and more attention at, in the EU uh, trying to address that question. And I think Fit for 55 comes with a lot of social uh, funds. And I think that we have to look more at investments rather than policy um, to address this. But I think for, for us or for, for Umeå, it will be high level jobs. So the, most of the jobs that we're looking at with the new industry moving up north. So I'm not sure it's, it, I think it, it will vary a lot depending on country. Mm -hmm. We have a question in the chat from Shogofa. So it's how are new skills created for a circular economy transition in your city? So what kind of capacity building programs could be established for new skill developments? I don't know, Lee, whether you want to, or Jan, you want to take that question? Yeah, one, one of the projects that still is a bit in the pilot phase in Leuven is a material bank. So it's, it's tried to be, it's, it's sort of a hub. We try to collect uh, uh, possible building materials that, that can find a second life. I hope that in the future we can try to uh, elevate it to a, a higher higher level. But this means that some totally new kind of job will, will be there trying to look for, let's say, new clients, new uh, possibilities for these materials that were regarded as waste. That's a, a new kind of interesting kind of job that that can work on a, on on an urban scale. I think that that's one example. The second example is we have a pilot project in Leuven for um, circular renovation of old uh, apartments, and this is new because uh, we are trying to find uh, architects who who are willing to to step into the pilot project. We are trying to find construction firms who will be willing. But if if it works. And if we then can um, can introduce these elements in our public procurement from the city or in our building regulations, then we will are enforcing a new sector of architects and construction firms uh, that that will be working in a new logic. And I think this will be interesting for for lots of uh, uh, people to to find a job. And I hope so because maybe. That's that's what we hope. If if we have, have a more circular building system, it will be more localized. It will we will not lose as much value that always is is going away from the city. And we hope that that by looking at city as kind of a library of materials, that we can keep the jobs and keep the value there and and give a more let's say durable prospect for for the jobs of, of lots of people. Uh, we have another question in the chat around, and this is, so we've talked a lot about um, uh, mitigation and material footprints, and so circular economy comes in there, but the question is from Arno, and it's about how much is climate change adaptation a driver for introducing improved circular economy solutions? So, Levi, I see you put down your microphone. I was so going to say a lot. That's uh, that's our that's our that's one of our important we have uh, five goals uh, five five fingers and one of them is to half the child po po uh, poverty but another one is to become a climate neutral city so that's the biggest big umbrella I'm working within so that's that's absolutely a, a, a main driver at least for us. Thanks Liv. Ander? Yeah, on climate change, just to add, uh, also based on, on the on the work uh, I presented before, that uh, climate change is, is the main driver uh, to the circular economy for uh, more than 70% of the, the cities and regions uh, we surveyed. And this is, uh, and this, this happens because cities are both uh, vulnerable to, to, to climate change impacts, but also they, they, they can uh, in, importantly, contribute to uh, to, to climate risk uh, as they, they they, for example, uh, and the circular economy can can can, can also help uh, mitigate this, as as we found uh, that the adoption of a circular economy framework in five key areas for for cities, which were the steel, plastic, aluminium, cement, and food, 
uh, could achieve a reduction of 9.3 billion tons of uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, in 2050. So, so the circular economy can, of course, uh, help uh, in this in this objective. Thank you, Ander. So linking that to some of the work that we're doing on the uh, Urban Circularity Assessment Framework Project, where we're trying to see opportunities for reducing uh, resource and material use. So Marina, maybe you want to comment upon what have you found? So we're looking at material recovery, energy recovery, social impacts now too. How have you found this integration of all these different domains into a framework? Well, we are looking at uh, all possible indicators, like monitoring and evaluation becomes really important when we're trying to track and measure progress towards uh, more circular cities. And uh, um, as everybody mentioned pretty much today, that social aspects, jobs, social economic aspects are, are pretty important. So we would also like to, to evaluate and measure the uh, uh, contribution of the circular economy model to these aspects of sustainability and sustainable development. Um, the challenges we came across so far, um, well, even establishing biophysical boundaries uh, also to response to the question in chat, it, it is quite uh, tricky on a city level. So how do you define system boundaries? Um, because, well, the city is not really a closed system. Um, but uh, when it comes to the social aspects, uh, so far, uh, the existing frameworks, the existing um, ways of measuring pretty much are limited to uh, jobs creation. Uh, but then the, the challenge here would be how do we measure uh, job creation in terms of specific uh, sectors uh, that are relevant for circularity. And uh, if the cities don't collect data specifically on that level, it becomes a bit uh, problematic. Uh, you can, uh, there are ways of uh, using proxies, but uh, we still think that it might not give us a clear picture. But then other social aspects, such as equality, for example, or uh, education for circular economy, or as Anna mentioned, investment in, uh, which is really important both for the municipalities and public sector, but also important for the private sector. So it does, uh, I would like to disagree slightly with Anna on uh, policies are not that important, uh, investment is more important, but we do have to create policies to support the investment. So then it comes to how do we measure governance uh, for, promoting circular economy, but also the governments of circular transition itself, which has also been touched upon. So uh, this is our struggle for now. We're trying to come up with solutions and uh, we are looking for support from the municipalities because they do know better, hopefully. Thanks, Marina. Um, in the interest of time, I will share my screen and show you the results of the Mentimeter. So in the beginning of the, this webinar, we asked a question around um, what do you, uh, which, who would be affected and how would they be affected and what social consequences can you foresee? I am hoping I am sharing my screen here. I think we had 16 people so far answer the question. And so uh, answers are around uh, cohesion, improved well-being, problem displacements, so shifting the environmental burden to other cities and regions, um, higher costs, less waste, emission reduction, so quite a few environmental uh, consequences. Um, also some uh, more uh, social governance ones like empowerment. Uh, maybe people feel more satisfied or happy. Uh, can have a positive on achieve, impact on achieving the SDGs. And the gap between the rich and the poor might still be prevalent. I don't know whether any of my the panelists want to comment upon these uh, categories. And I would say, personally, I think the one, the gap between the rich and the poor might still be prevalent because it is quite unclear, in my personal opinion, how we could design policies that could work to tackle the material footprint effectively. Um, because I don't think there is a, an answer to that yet. But I don't know whether anyone wants to comment upon. Uh, I, I don't think we should be that pessimistic, uh, but it's important to see 
what is the aim, the general aim of our circular economy? Is it just a new strategy to once again try to enhance competitiveness of our industry and just keep our growth paradigm going? If that's the aim of circular economy, it will not work. It will just be a, a new disguise for the same thing. If we have the courage, and this should be done, it, it's difficult to do it on, the, on an urban level, but on a higher level, for instance, to introduce really uh, targets on the use of, of the amount of materials we use. Uh, can we install uh, product norms that that oblige producers to make products repairable, that oblige them to uh, make sure that, that they are sustainable? Can we introduce a fiscal system that makes a system of um, as a service more interesting than just throwing away all things? Uh, are we uh, prepared to introduce an, an income system uh, that get that makes inequality something of the past? Are we prepared to install measures to bring down, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the, the amount of of, um, of of how we use airplanes to transport? Are we willing to to take structural uh, uh, things or not? Uh, because, for instance, it, it's mentioned rebound effects are very important. We should not be hypocritical. Um, we have lots of, let's say, uh, leftist or green, like I am, uh, middle class people going with a cargo back to the repair shop and then going home and take the airplane to fly to, to Africa. This, they have the largest footprint and they consider themselves as being very green and ecological, but the actual footprint of them is too high. So we need structural things as well. Otherwise, it will not work. And mm -hmm. do we have the courage or not? That's the question. I think what you're touching upon is on the behavioral change. It's the same with a little bit climate neutral cities, reducing your emissions that fit within the planetary boundaries. I think it's a challenge for, yeah, circular economy. I see it as a part of uh, climate neutrality overall, and that requires people to change behavior. Anna, you spoke about that uh, in your, uh, when we asked you, asked you a question as well, the importance of behavioral change. Yes. Um, well, I think I agree with, with Jan, and I also think that we have to look at who makes the largest uh, footprint and how can we change the behavior. I think like Marina said, I think policy is also important, but I think we have to look at what type of policy. I think policy regarding building in a new way, building with wood, building with um, reused material in a larger scale, those type of policies. But I think um, policies aim that changing behavior is, uh, is necessary, more difficult. And I think there we have to look more at maybe incentives rather than, than policies. But I think mm -hmm. it will be a large a large issue for, for a country like Sweden, where you have to, I think, you could feel like you are losing your your freedom or your um, yeah possibility possibility to travel or buy and so, things like that. Leave any final comments on the social impact and circular cities. No, I, I can I, I I just agree with a lot of what the, what Jan and Anna said. I think it's uh, it's sort of a par paradigm uh, shift. So it's uh, it's it's everything we need to. It's it's not something that, that would. It's not easy, but we have to do it. So I I I say no more. Thank you. Final words from Ander. Sorry, I've stopped sharing my screen. So now I see your hand, Ander. Yeah, I, just to follow up on what Anna said, I totally agree that uh, what we need are incentives. Uh, but I would say that the cities, for example, they have tools to, to create these incentives. They, 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 they can uh, work with uh, different taxes. They can also uh, include uh, circular criteria in their uh, public procurement processes. So there is also room for, for cities to to advance towards that and and well uh, um, also we regarding for example the the involvement or the yeah the involvement of the private sector uh, in the end uh, the circular economy is an, an economic agenda so uh, uh, if they understand and if they see the benefits of of of, the, of this transition of course they, they will uh, embrace uh, this new path so i think there is room for everybody, uh, even those with higher or or, or with um, the, the the smallest uh, footprint. 
to, to move towards a, a circular transition. Thanks a lot, Ander and fellow panelists for uh, your time today. We've come to the end of our 55 minute time slot. So thanks everyone for joining in uh, the discussion. We have a couple more questions in the chat, which we will do our best to answer. Um, it's very nice to have a conversation around social impacts and circular cities. What's next for us at SEI, KTH and UMIO is that we will do an assessment of uh, social impacts with UMIO City. And so we will be hoping to share some results in 2022. So do keep an eye out on our website and we might be in touch with uh, more news. Thanks a lot for today. Bye, everybody.